Chapter 5 The Veil Rent The black surrounding Molly Gruber split with a jagged tear right in front of him. Then he was blinded. Desperately he pushed his hands over his eyes, thanking goodness that now once again he had hands. The light was searing. Never before had he seen such light, he thought. But then, had he? Well, he thought back to his days as a street orderly or garbage collector. He thought of the big steel buildings he had seen erected and the welding equipment, the vivid light which the act of welding produced, a vivid, a vivid searing to his eyes that the operators had to use dark glasses all the time. Molly Gruber pressed his eyelids shut, pressed his hands over the eyes, and still he imagined he could see that light beating in through. Then he got control of himself somewhat and very carefully and very slightly uncovered his eyes. It was bright, there was no doubt about that. The light beat in through closed eyelids. Oh yes, it was bright all right. So he half opened his eyes, making them mere slits, and he peered out. My, what a wonderful scene he saw. The black had rolled away, disappeared, vanished forever, he hoped, and he was standing near trees. As he looked down, he saw vivid, lush green grass. He had never seen grass like that before. Then on the grass he saw little white things with yellow centres. He racked his brain. Whatever could it be? It came back to him. Of course, daisies, little daisies in the fields. He'd never seen them in reality before, but only in pictures, and at some time or other on a TV programme which he had watched through a shop window. But there were more things to see than daisies. He raised his eyes and looked sideways. There were two people there, one each side, and they were smiling down at him, smiling down because Molly Gruber was quite a small man, one of those insignificant little weasel people, shrunken, shriveled with gnarled hands and weather-beaten features. So he looked up at these two people, he'd never seen them before, but they were smiling at him in a very kind manner indeed. Well, Molly Gruber, said one, and what do you think of it here? Molly Gruber stood mute. How did he know how he felt? How did he know what he thought of the place? He'd hardly seen it yet. He looked at his feet, and he was happy to see that he had feet. Then he let his eyes travel up to his body. On that instant he jumped about a foot in the air, and he blushed from the roots of his hair to nails on his toes. "'Jumping with jeepers!' he said to himself. "'And here's me standing in front of these people with nary a stitch on me to cover my nakedness.' Quickly his hands went down to the immemorial gesture of people caught with their pants off. The two men beside him roared with laughter. One said, Molly Gruber, Molly Gruber, what is wrong with you, lad? You weren't born with clothes on, were you? If you were then, then you are about the only person who has ever been. If you want some clothes, think them up. Molly Gruber was in quite a panic. For a moment he could not think what clothes were like. He was in such a state of confusion. Then he thought of what was called a union suit or boiler suit, a thing which was a combination garment, a suit which went from the ankles up the neck with sleeves to it, and you put it on through an opening in the front. No sooner had he thought about it than he found he was clad in a union suit. He looked down and shuddered anew. It was a bright red union suit, the colour of a perfect blush. The two men laughed again, and a woman walking on a path nearby turned towards them and smiled. As she walked towards them, she called out, "'What is this, Boris? And you are still afraid of his own skin?' The one called Boris laughed and replied, "'Yes, Maisie, we get them every day, don't we?' Molly Gruber shuddered as he looked at the woman. He thought, well, uh, she's been a right one for sure. I hope I'm safe in this. I don't know any more about women. They all laughed uproariously. Poor Molly Gruber did not realise that on this particular plane of existence every one was telepathic. Look about you, Molly Gruber, said the woman. Then we'll take you off and give you a briefing on where you are and all the rest of it. You've been a sore trial to us. You wouldn't come out of your black cloud no matter what we said to you. 
Molly Gruber muttered something to himself, and it was such a matter that it even came out as a garbled mutter by telepathy. But he looked about him. He was in some sort of park. Never in his life had he imagined that there would be such a park as this. The grass was greener than any grass he'd ever seen before. The flowers, and there were flowers in great profusion, were of more vivid hues than anything he'd ever seen. The sun was beating down. It was pleasantly warm. There was the hum of insects and the chirping of birds. Molly Gruber looked up. The sky was blue, an intense deep blue, with white fleecy clouds. Then Molly Gruber almost fell with astonishment. He felt his legs grow weak. Cor, he said, where's the flippin' sun? One of the men smiled and said, you are not on earth, you know, Molly Gruber. You are not anywhere near earth. You are a long, long way away in a different time, in a different plane of existence. Altogether, you have a lot to learn, my friend. Cor said Molly Gruber. How in the name of tarnation can you have sunlight when there ain't no sun? His three companions, two men and a woman, just smiled at him, and the woman took him gently by the arm, saying, Come on, we'll take you in, and then we will explain a lot of things to you. Together, the four of them walked across the grass and onto a beautifully paved path. Hey! shouted Molly Gruber. This here path ain't half stinging my feet. I haven't got any shoes on. That caused a fresh outburst of merriment. Boris said, Well, Molly Gruber, why don't you think up a pair of shoes, or a pair of boots, or whatever you want? You manage it with your clothing, although I must say I don't think much of the colour. You ought to change it. Molly Gruber thought, and thought, he thought what a sight he must have looked dressed up in the red union suit with no shoes. He wished he was free of that wretched suit, and immediately he was. Oh! he screamed, and now I'm naked in front of a female. Oh, sad is me. I've never been naked in front of a female before. Oh, Cor, what will she think of me? The woman absolutely shouted with laughter, and several people on the path turned to watch with amusement what was going on. The woman said, "'Well, well, well, it's quite all right, Molly Gruber. You haven't much to show after all, have you? But anyway, just think of yourself dressed up in your Sunday best with a nice pair of shoes, beautifully polished, and if you think about it, you'll be dressed in those things.' He did, and he was. Molly Gruber walked along very gingerly. Every time he looked at the woman, he blushed anew. He was getting uncomfortably hot under the collar, because poor old Molly Gruber on earth had been one of those unfortunate people who liked to watch and not to do, and that is even worse when you cannot go anywhere to watch and you cannot have anyone with whom to do it. Molly Gruber's knowledge of the opposite sex, incredible though it seems in this modern age, was confined to what he saw in magazines on the magazine racks of stores and the somewhat lurid pictures which were put out at the front of the local cinemas to titillate the appetites of prospective customers. He thought again about his past, thought again how little he knew of women. He called to mind how he had thought that women were just about solid from the neck down, all the way to their knees. He had never considered how they walked under such conditions, but then he had seen some girls bathing in the river, and he saw that they had legs, arms, etc., just as he had. He was roused from his thoughts by screams of laughter, and he found he had collected quite a crowd. People had got his thoughts because thought and speech were much the same in this world. He looked about him, blushed anew, and he really took to his heels. The two men and the woman ran after him, absolutely gasping trying to keep up with him, and falling back every so often because they laughed so much. Molly Gruber ran on and on until at last his energy was spent, and he sank down with a thud on the park bench. A pursuer caught up with him, and they were absolutely weeping with merriment. Molly Gruber, Molly Gruber, you better keep from thinking until we get you inside. They indicated a beautiful building just off to the right. Just keep your mind on keeping your clothes on until we get in that building. We will explain everything to you. They rose their feet, and the two men moved one each side of Molly Gruber, and each grasped him by an arm. Together they marched on and turned off the path to the right, and entered 
a very elegant marble entrance way. Inside it was cool, and there was a pleasantly subdued light which seemed to be radiating from the walls. There was a reception desk, much the same as Molly Gruber had seen when peering through hotel doors. A man there smiled pleasantly and said, "'New one?' Maisie nodded her head and said, "'Yes, a very green one, too.' Molly Gruber looked down at himself in horror, thinking for a moment that he'd gone from red to green, and then he was brought back to his senses by renewed laughter. They moved on across the hall and down a corridor. There were a number of people about there. Molly Gruber kept on blushing. Some of the men and women were clad in clothes of various types. Some wore quite outlandish clothes. Others wore nothing at all, and did not seem to be perturbed in the slightest. By the time they got Molly Gruber into a very comfortable furnished room, he was sweating profusely. He was sweating as much as if he had come just out of a swimming pool, not that he had ever been in one. He sank into a chair with a sigh of relief, and started dabbing at his face with a handkerchief which he had found in his pocket. "'Phew! Phew!' quoth he. "'Let me get out of this place. Let me get back to earth. I can't stick a place like this.' Maisie laughed down at him and said, but you have to stay here, Molly Gruber. Remember, you are an atheist. You do not believe in a god. You do not believe in a religion. You do not believe in life after death. Well, you are still here, so there must be some life after death, wasn't there? There were very large windows in the room to which they had taken Molly Gruber. His eyes kept straying to the windows, looking in fascination to the scene outside. The beautiful, beautiful parkland, and a lake in the centre with a pleasant river flowing into the lake. He saw men and women and a few children. Everyone seemed to be walking about purposefully, as if they knew where they were going, as if they knew what they were going to do. He looked in utter fascination as a man suddenly swerved off a path and sat down on a park bench and took a packet of sandwiches out of his pocket. Quickly he tore off the wrappings and carefully deposited the waste paper in a bin placed near the park bench. Then he set to to demolish the sandwiches. As he watched, Molly Gruber felt faint. He heard horrid rumblings coming from his abdomen. He looked up at Maisie and said, "'By golly, I feel hungry.' "'When do we eat round here?' He felt about in his pocket, wondering if he had any money on him. He could have done with a hamburger or something like that. The woman looked down at him with sympathetic understanding and said, "'You can have whatever food you like, Molly Gruber, whatever you desire to drink also. Just think what you want, and you can have it. But remember that you think up a table first, or else you have to eat off the floor.' One of the men turned toward him and said, we will leave you for a little time, Molly Gruber. You feel that you want food? Well, think what you want. But, as Maisie said, think of a table first. When you have had this food, which truly you don't need, we will come back to you. With that, they went to the wall which parted, they stepped through, and the wall closed behind them. It all seemed very peculiar to Molly Gruber. What was all this about thinking up your food? What was all this about not wanting food? The fellow had said he truly did not need it. What did he mean by that? However, the pangs of hunger were pressing, terribly pressing. Molly Gruber was so hungry that he thought he was going to faint. It was a familiar sensation. Often, in early years, he had fainted through sheer hunger, and such a thing is thoroughly unpleasant. He wondered how he had to think. First of all, though, what about this table? Well, he knew what a table was like. Any fool would know that. But when he came to think about it, it was not so easy. His first attempt at thinking up a table was ridiculous in the extreme. He thought of how he had looked in furniture shops while he was sweeping the sidewalks. He thought of a nice round metal table with a sunshade over it. And then his attention had been drawn to another decorating table, like a work table for women. Now, to his astonishment, he found that the creation in front of him was a white metal table, or half of it, and half of a lady's work table, which was quite an unstable contraption. He pushed his hand at it and said, Phew, go away, go away fast, just as he had seen in some films years before. And then he thought again, 
and he thought of a table in the park that he used to visit, a thing made of planks and logs. He pictured it up as clearly as he could, and commanded it to be in front of him. Well, it was. It was a rough piece of work indeed. The planks were almost as crude as the logs themselves, and he saw that he had forgotten to think up a seat. But that was all right. He could use a chair in the room. He pulled one up to the table, and then he found that the table he had thought into being had no relation to actual size. He could sit under it, complete with the chair. At last he got everything right. Then he thought of food. Poor Molly Gruber was one of the world's unfortunates. He had lived hand to mouth all his life, lived on coffee, soft drinks and things like hamburgers. So he thought of a plate of hamburgers, and when they materialized in front of him, he grabbed one in a hurry and gave a hearty bite. The whole thing collapsed because there was nothing inside. After many trials and many errors, he decided that he had to think clearly, clearly, clearly from the ground up, so to speak, and if he wanted a hamburger, he had to think of the filling and then put the other pieces outside. At last he got it just right, but just as he bit into the finished product, he decided that there was not much taste to it. It was even worse when he tried the coffee he had thought up. It looked all right, but the taste was nothing that he had ever tasted before, and nothing that he ever wanted to taste again. He came to the conclusion that his imagination was wrong, but he kept on trying, producing this and then that, but never going far from coffee and hamburgers, and perhaps a piece of bread. But because he had never in his life eaten fresh bread, it was always stale, mouldy bread. For some time there was a the sound of Molly Gruber's chumping drawers as he devoured hamburgers, and then there was the slurping as he drank his coffee. Then he just pushed away from the table and sat back to think of all the peculiar things that had happened to him. First of all, he remembered that he did not believe in life after death. Where was he now, then? He thought of his decaying body and the involuntary look at it, and he was almost sick all over the floor. Then he thought of the strange experiences. First he appeared to be stuck in a barrel of tar. The tar had vanished and been replaced by black smoke like the time he had had a kerosene lamp and turned it too high before leaving his room. And when he got back he thought at first he had gone blind. He could not see anything at all because there were black smuts flying all over the place. He remembered what his landlady had said to him. But suddenly he turned around. There was Boris standing beside him, saying, Well, you've had a good meal, I see, but why do you stick to these awful hamburgers? I think they are vile things. You can have whatever you want, you know, provided you think of it carefully, provided you build it up stage by stage from the ingredients up to the final cooked thing. Molly Gruber looked up at him and said, Where do I wash up the dishes? Boris laughed at him in honest amusement and said, My dear man, you don't wash dishes here. You think up dishes and you think away dishes. All you have to do when you finish is to think of the dishes disappearing and the component parts are going back into nature's reservoir. It's simple. You'll get used to it. But you don't need to eat, you know. You get all the nourishment you need from the atmosphere. Molly Gruber felt really sour about the whole affair. How ridiculous it was to say that you get nourishment from the atmosphere around one. It was too absurd to be believed. What sort of a man did this Boris think he was? He, Molly Gruber, knew what it was to starve. He knew what it was to fall on the sidewalk in a faint from lack of food. He knew what it was like to have a policeman come and kick him in the ribs and tell him to get to his feet, get gone or else. The man said, well, we've got to go. It's no good sticking here all the time. I've got to take you down to see the doctor. He's going to tell you a few things and try to help you straighten out. Come along. With that he thought at the table and the remnants of the meal and the whole lot disappeared into thin air. Then he led Molly Gruber up to the wall which parted before them and opened out into a long shining corridor. People were wandering about, but they all seemed to have a purpose. They all seemed to be going somewhere, all seemed to be doing something. And yet he, Molly Gruber, was completely befuzzled about everything. He and the man walked down the corridor. 
Then they turned a corner, and the man knocked at a green door. "'Come in,' said a voice, and the man pushed Molly Gruber in and turned on his tracks, leaving him. Molly Gruber looked about him in fright. Again, it was a comfortable room, but the big man sitting at a desk really frightened him. It made him think of a medical officer of health he had seen before. Yes, that was it. The medical officer of health who had examined him when he wanted to get the job as a street cleaner. The man had been very brusque and had sneered at Molly Gruber's poor physique and said he didn't think him strong enough to push a broom. But anyway, he had relented enough to say that, yes, Molly Gruber was fit enough to do a job of cleaning the sidewalks. But now this man sitting at his desk looked up and smiled cheerfully, saying, Come and sit here, Molly. I've got to talk to you. Hesitating, almost afraid to take a step, Molly Gruber moved forward and quite shakily sat on a chair. The big man looked him up and down and said, More nervous than most, aren't you? What's wrong with you, lad? Poor Molly Gruber didn't know what to say. Life had been such a terrible thing to him, and now it seemed to him that death was even worse, so his story poured out. The big man sat back and listened. Then he said, Now you listen to me for a bit. I know you have had a rough time, but you have made it rougher for yourself. You haven't got a mere chip on your shoulder. You've got a log or perhaps a whole forest. You've got to change your conceptions about a lot of things. Molly Gruber stared at him. Some of the words meant nothing to him, and the big man at last asked, Well, what is it? What's wrong now? Molly Gruber replied, Some of the words, I just don't understand them. I, I didn't get any education, you know. I only learned what I picked up myself. The man thought for a moment, apparently reviewing in his mind just what he had said. Then he said, Oh, I don't think I said any unusual words. What don't you understand? Molly Gruber looked down and said humbly, Conception? I always thought conception was what people did when they were having babies starting up. That's the only meaning I know. The big man, the doctor, gazed at Molly Gruber with open-mouthed amazement. Then he laughed and laughed and laughed and said, Conception? Well, conception doesn't mean just that. It also means understanding. If you have no conception of a thing, you have no understanding of it. And that's all it means. You have no conception of this, that, or something else. Let's make it simpler, then. Let's say you don't know a darn thing about it. But you've got to. All this was a great puzzle to Molly Gruber. His mind was still on conception, and if the man had meant understanding or misunderstanding or not understanding, then why in the name of old scrubbing brushes couldn't he say so? But then he realised the man was talking, so he sat back and listened. You do not believe in death, or rather, you do not believe in life after death. You left your body, and you floated around. You didn't seem to get it into your thick head that you had left a decaying body, and you were still alive. You were concentrating on nothingness all the time. So, if you can't imagine anywhere, you can't go there, can you? If you make yourself so darn sure that there is nothing, then for you, there is nothing. You only get what you expect. You only get what you believe, what you can realise, what you can understand. So, we try to shock you, and that is why we pushed you back to the funeral home to let you see a few stiffs being parked and polished and done up for show. We try to let you see that you are just a poor stiff and nobody to care a donkey's hoot about you. That's why you got buried in a coat of sawdust. But even that wasn't enough. We had to show you your grave, we had to show you your coffin, and then we showed you your rotting body. We didn't like it, but it took even more than that to make you wake up to the fact that you weren't dead. Molly Gruber sat there like a man in a trance. He was dimly understanding and trying hard to understand more, but the doctor went on. Matter cannot be destroyed. It can only change its form, and inside a human body there is a living, immortal soul, a soul that lasts for ever and ever and ever. It takes more than one's body, because it's got to get all manner of experiences. If it has to be fighting experience, it takes the body of a warrior, and so on. 
but when the body is killed it is no more than having a worn-out suit of clothes tossed in the garbage bin. The soul, the astral body, call it whatever you like, moves on, moves out of the wreckage, moves away from the garbage, and is ready to start again. But if that soul has lost a lot of comprehension, or even did not have any comprehension, then we've got quite a job teaching it. Molly Gruber nodded, and he was dimly thinking of that old author who had written some things which were quite beyond Molly Gruber's comprehension at the time, but now little bits were fitting in, and fitting in, and fitting in like a jigsaw puzzle nearing its completion. The doctor said, If a person doesn't believe in heaven or a life hereafter, then when that person gets to the other side of death, he wanders about. There is nowhere for him to go. There is no one to greet him, because all the time he is thoroughly convinced that there is nothing. He is in the position of a blind man who says to himself that as he cannot see, then things cannot be. He looked shrewdly at Molly Grover to see if he was falling, and when he saw that he was, he went on, You probably wonder where you are. Well, you are not in hell. You've just come from it. The only hell is that place you call Earth. There is no other hell. There is no hellfire and damnation. There is no everlasting torture. There are no devils with burning brands to come and send you in various indelicate places. You go to earth to learn, to experience things, to broaden your course of experiences, and when you've learned that which you went down to earth to learn, then your body falls apart and you come up to astral realms. There are many different planes of existence. This is the lowest the one nearest the earth plane, and you are here on this lowest one because you haven't the understanding to go higher, because you haven't the capacity to believe. If you went to a higher realm now, you would be blinded on the spot by the intense radiation of their much higher vibration. He looked a bit glum as he saw Molly Gruber was hopelessly lost. He thought it over and then said, well, you'd better have a rest for a bit. I don't want to strain your brains such as they are, so you'd better have a rest, and then later I will tell you some more. He rose to his feet and opened the door, saying, In there with you, have a rest, and I'll see you later. Molly Gruber walked into the room, which seemed to be very comfortable indeed, but as he passed what might be considered a halfway mark on the door, everything ceased to be, and Molly Gruber, although he didn't know it, was sound asleep, having his astral batteries charged up as they had been seriously depleted by all the strange experiences he had undergone in hearing of things beyond his comprehension.